<laughs> so one of the things I really love about the Lecky Forum and other housing get-togethers is that everyone is so glad to see one another. And there have been lots of sidebar conversations and greetings. And it's great to see so many of you here today, those of you we already know well and others who are new. And just a pleasure to see everyone. My name is Mary Margaret Whipple, and I serve as chair of the board of the Alliance for Housing Solutions. Um, AHS is a 501c3 organization that's working to increase the supply of affordable housing to Arlington and Northern Virginia. And public education events like this are one of the chief ways that we do hear about some new ideas and think about how we can do that. Uh, while we do have a very small but very efficient staff and a dedicated board of directors, we couldn't be able to do what we do without all the partners that we have in this endeavor. Uh, we're so very grateful for our generous uh, Champions Circle partners in affordable housing. These partners are people who support AHS events all through the year. And if you are here, just please wave. I know some of you are at least of AHC, Walter Webdale, there's Walter back there, the Gary O'Mara Family Foundation, Mike Gary, the Meyer Foundation, Sonia Quinones and Aisha Young, and the Virginia Housing Development Authority, uh, Ayana Du is representing them here today. Then at our investor level partners include APA and the Venable Foundation. We have Nina Janapal and Kedrick Whitmore here today. There's Nina. A big thank you to our builder partners, our new neighbor, Amazon, JBG Smith, John Annalyn and Virginia Jeffrey, and Charles and Jennifer Lawson. And we have a number of patron partners that support our work throughout the year. Bank of America, McGuire Woods, Rock Spring Congregational Church, NBAR Cares, and as always, a group of individual and dedicated families throughout Arlington. Also special thanks to Habitat for Humanity and Wesley Housing. And on the day of the Lecky Forum, we're so pleased to have our dear friend Dolores Lecky with us today. Thank you for being here. We're pleased to have a number of our elected officials here today, including several members of the county board, a wave or stand, Katie Crystal, Matt DeFerranti, Christian Dorsey, Eric Gutchell, Senator Adam Eben, and as a visitor uh, that we're so pleased is here today, a DC council member, Anita Bonds. So these partners and sponsors are one of the things that make AHS such a unique organization. We bring together all kinds of different groups of individuals, companies, organizations that are interested in working together to find innovative and effective solutions to the affordable housing challenges that we face. Before we get started with today's program on planning for equity and affordability, I'd like to introduce one of those partners, Aisha Alexander Young, Director for Strategy and Equity at the Eugene and Agnes Meyer Foundation. And I found out from her bio that she went to Hampton University and knows my friend, Dean Mamie Locke. So, and there must be another good Hampton <laughs> person back there. Aisha's role at the Meyer Foundation is to integrate racial equity into all areas of their work, both internally and externally. She's not only an expert on race and equity issues, but she has a lot of experience working to advance equitable neighborhood development in the city of Charlotte. So she also knows about the kind of planning issues that we're discussing today. Welcome, Aisha. So I already felt at home knowing there were so many housing and neighborhood advocates in the room, and then I heard a Hamptonian, so I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. So thank you so much for the warm welcome, Mary, and for the invitation, Michelle, and AHS. I'm so grateful to be here to uh, represent the Meyer Foundation and also just uh, uh, support our partner in AHS. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Meyer Foundation's work, but before I do that, if you all will indulge me, I, I want to tell a little bit of a, a personal story that really speaks to how I came to be connected to the work of housing and why I care about this issue. Um, so I've always had a fascination with housing and zoning, um, even though as a child I probably wouldn't have that exact language. Uh, I grew up in the city of Charlotte, wonderful city, um, but Throughout my childhood, Charlotte, and still today, quite frankly, was divided into four quadrants. And so you had, uh, in the, the north, you had mostly black folk. And in the south, you had mostly old, older money white people. In the east, you had an uh, immigrant community, lots of different diversity, lots of uh, cultural and ethnicities, ethnicities represented. And then in the north, you had uh, kind of newer money white folks that were came to the city of Charlotte uh, due to the banking economy. So I grew up uh, kind of migrating through all four of those quadrants <laughs> throughout, my, throughout my childhood, and I was very curious about it all. My parents chose to buy a home in South Charlotte so my brother and I could have access to a better a public uh, education and bu better public systems. But as one of the few uh, families of color in that South Charlotte community, we were subject to institutional racism almost on a daily basis races. Now, weekly, we would drive all over the city, but particularly to the west side of Charlotte, which is the, the traditional black community where most of our family still lived. It's where we went to church. It's where we went to the YMCA. Uh, it's where I spent a lot of my childhood, and it's where my fondest memories lie. And so we would drive there, and we would go under the 277 underpass, and that, of course, was funded, like many uh, state highways, through the Federal Highway Act. And as soon as you cross under that underpass, you would immediately see the physical difference. I'm talking about from beautiful grocery stores and restaurants and shops to lots of liquor stores, um, that you would see the decay and the, the infrastructure, the streets. And it was a literal and physical barrier to opportunity. And that's where most of my family lived. And I was disturbed by the fact that my cousins did not have the same access to the opportunities that I had just by driving under an underpass. And I was very curious about that. And I, I thought it was just happenstance. And then I come to learn so many things of how that came to be. And so when I would go over to the west side, my, my favorite times were spent um, with my grandfather, Romeo Alexander, who will turn 98 years old uh, this year. And so as you can imagine, he had many stories to tell. Um, so he would tell me about the neighborhood that he grew up in, Brooklyn, not Brooklyn, New York, a neighborhood in Charlotte called Brooklyn that was decimated during urban renewal. Uh, he would tell me about, despite having only an elementary school education, how he became a home builder and he built homes for black teachers and doctors and civil rights activists that were confined to the west side because of redlining and the racial co neighborhood covenants. Uh, he told me about the restaurant that he used to manage called Rosati's uh, that was claimed during eminent domain by the city when it started to grow and they wanted to make more room for more affluent homes and people of color were further displaced into pockets of poverty. Today, I just I speak to him every day, and today he, he'll, he'll tell me about all of the harassment he receives from real estate investors um, that are trying to now purchase his home now that everyone has an interest in uh, being back in the urban communities that they once pushed people of color into. And so these are the experiences that made me so passionate about housing, about neighborhoods, and about racial equity. It taught me about the incredible power that exists in housing to determine access to opportunity, quality of life, and well-being. So everyone in this room as an advocate or a person who's actively working on affordable housing, on issues of housing and zoning, you have incredible power 
immense power. The decisions that you make every single day can determine if we will be a nation where race determines your zip code and your zip code determines your access to opportunities, or if we will become a nation truly grounded in justice and equality. So even though Charlotte is where my heart is, is and where my home is, today I find myself in, in Maryland, but working in DC and also working in Northern Virginia as a part of the Eugene and Agnes E. Meyer Foundation. So the foundation is 75 years old and it was started by Eugene Meyer, who was the original owner of the Washington Post, and his wife, who was an investigative journalist and a human rights activist, Agnes E. Meyer. And so the foundation has, for the past 75 years, run on a, a very well-intentioned mission um, to improve the lives of our, our neighbors, our families, and communities, and throughout DC, uh, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Maryland, as well as Northern Virginia. Very well-intentioned mission, ha mission has done incredible work over the past 75 years. But when the executive di director, who is a legend in her own right, I'm sure many of you know her, uh, Julie Rogers, retired after being at Meyer 75, uh, 25 years. She wasn't there the whole time. <laughs> wasn't there the whole time. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> But after being there 25 years, our new CEO came in, who is our current CEO, Nikki Gorin. And like any new leader would do coming in, she went on a listening tour here in, in Arlington, across Northern Virginia, across our, our full region. And she was talking to our nonprofit partners, to community leaders, government leaders, um, business leaders and asking about what is Meyer doing? What can we do better? What are the issues in your community? And at every single conversation, particularly in housing, but in every single conversation, it always came back to if the Meyer Foundation and institutions in general are not addressing race and racism, then you are never going to be able to achieve your mission. And so Nikki decided to do something I think was really brave at that point in time. She called our board chair, and remember she's a new executive director, she calls her board chair, who is in the world of housing, and she said, we need to stop our strategic planning process, which had also been in process for years um, and was almost done. And she said, we need to stop and we need to throw it all away and we need to start again and start this analysis based on race. And the board and the staff made the decision to do that. And they came out of that process deciding to have a new vision, mission, and strategy that is focused on eradicating systemic racism and all of its consequences in the region. Mm. Mm. So I do want to bring this back very briefly to Agnes E. Meyer. So a lot of people said or thought that this was a very stark pivot for the foundation. You know, doing this uh, 75 years, like racial just justice is so controversial, even though it shouldn't be. But there was a lot of a, there was a little bit of an alarm. But when you look back at the work of Agnes E. Meyer, I believe this is exactly the work that she would want us to be doing. It was the investigative journalism that Agnes Meyer did um, when she went around DC and then several other communities across the country, and she documented the deplorable living conditions in public and segregated housing uh, for black families and particularly black veterans returning from World War II. And so if you go back into the Supreme Court decisions, Birth and Brown versus the Board of Education, and the Supreme Court decisions that uh, outlawed uh, uh, segregation in housing and discriminatory policies in housing, you will find that investigative journalism of Agnes Meyer referenced in their decision. So this is actually very much so where, where we are meant to be. And this is the call that I think Agnes put out to us a long time ago. She would probably be a little bit upset that we're still working on these things. Um, but nonetheless, it's exactly what she would like us to do. So today, Meyer supports this work, uh, like the work that Alliance for Housing Solutions is doing, that moves the region toward long-lasting, measurable improvements for underinvested communities of color through meaningful, systemic change efforts. In housing, what that means for us is to create a large, stable supply of high quality of housing that is affordable and creates inclusive communities 
with access to strong schools and career opportunities. To reach this, this goal, we know we've, it's taken decades and generations to get in this place that we're in. And so to reach this goal, we know that we will need bold, audacious proposals and solutions. And to do that, we have to shatter the legacy of racism and segregation and its modern day applications. So we need really bold ideas, and I'm, I'm very confident in the people in this room that you have those bold ideas. But bold ideas come from a place like Minneapolis right now and the work that Andrea ben Brennan is doing. And so I'm excited to hear about the work that's happening in Minneapolis. It may not be the exact formula for our, our region, but that type of thinking that says, we don't have to keep on moving in the same way that we've been doing that has created this terrible place that we're all in, and racism affects everyone. Uh, we don't have to keep on moving in that same way. We don't have to just tweak the existing things. We can do something drastically different. And so I want to thank again AHS for having me here. I'm excited to listen and learn. And thank you all for listening.